Speaker, Ken Harrison is Chairman and CEO of the Portland General Corporation, a holding company, and Chairman and Chief Executive Officer and President of its largest subsidiary, Portland General Electric Company. PGE is a $3.5 billion electric utility. He serves as director on the PGC and the PGE boards. Prior to joining the utility in 1975, Mr. Harrison had a 10-year career as a financial analyst and portfolio manager in the investment management business and was vice president for First Interstate Bank in the trust investment department. He's a chartered financial analyst and a graduate of the Stanford University Executive Program. He holds a BS in math and science and an MA degree in psychology and sociology from our own Oregon State University. Ken also currently serves as director for Edison Electric Institute, Oregon Business Council, the Oregon Independent College Foundation, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, the Oregon Children's Foundation, Oregon State University Foundation, and SOLVE, uh, which as many of you know is Stop Oregon Littering and Vandalism. He's also a member of the Portland Ambassador Program, which is an organization working on economic development, and he currently chairs the governor's, Governor Kitzhaber's Transportation Initiative Committee for the, for the business sector. And no stranger to mergers, Ken Lay is chairman and CEO of Enron Corporation. He was named to that position in February 1986, following the merger of Houston Natural Gas and Internorth Inc. in July of 1985. Previously, Lay was president of Continental Resources Company, which was formerly Florida Gas Company, and executive vice president of the Continental Group, which is the parent company of Continental Resources Company. He joined Houston Natural Gas in June 1984 as chairman and chief executive officer. A native of Missouri, Lay was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate in economics from the University of Missouri, where he also received a master's degree in economics. Upon graduation, he began his career in 1965 as a corporate executive with, well, as a corporate economist with Exxon Company USA. Subsequently, he earned a PhD in economics from the University of, of Houston. Mr. Lay held the positions of technical assistance to the Commissioner of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I would note just last Wednesday that FERC approved this merger that we're talking about today with respect to the wholesale market issue. And he also served as Deputy Undersecretary of, for Energy of the US Department of, Energy, of U.S. Department of Interior in the Nixon administration in the early 70s. Additionally, while in Washington, Lay was an assistant professor at George Washington University, teaching graduate courses in micro and macroeconomic theory and government and business relations. Currently, Lay serves on the board of directors of Compaq Computer Corporation, Eli Lilly and Company, and Trust Company of the West. He's a member of the President's Council on Sustainable Development, the Business Council, the National P Petroleum Council, and the American Enterprise Institute. Previous key roles have included serving as chairman of the Greater Houston Partnership, the University of Houston Board of Regents, the Houston Host Committee for the 1992 Republican National Convention, and co-chairman of the 1990 Houston Economic Host Committee. Well, with that, gentlemen, the podium is yours to make your case to us, your ratepayers, uh, and maybe some shareholders, and maybe some members of public interest groups as well, and our 15,000 member radio audience. Ken? Thank you, Christine, and thank you to uh, uh, the City Club and for all of the distinguished guests that are here. I have to, uh, I have to confess that when I first uh, approached Ken Lay about uh, coming back to uh, Portland and speaking in front of a group on Friday, um, he was a, said, you know, I'm not sure that's uh, the right thing to do. 
But when I told him that uh, the two panelists were going to be uh, former PUC commissioners, he recalled how much fun the last time we were in front of the PUC. <laughs> and so he immediately hopped on a plane, and, and here he is today. I, uh, I, I do want to, uh, to uh, again, thank you for being here and having this, this opportunity uh, for us to talk uh, with you and hear from you as well, listen to your questions and, and engage in a dialogue, both about our merger but also about the dramatic changes in the energy industry. Truly, our industry is involved in a very important transformation and one that is so profound it will affect our entire society and all of us as consumers. But before I get into that, I would like to acknowledge up front that this merger process has been uh, both a demanding and uh, challenging learning experience. Now, for instance, had I known early on uh, that our two primary panelists were going to be former PUC commissioners, would have given me full opportunity to introduce a bill to legislature that would have prohibited that participation. <laughs> <clears throat> it's also been delightful to learn how, how much some of, our, uh, some of our friendly competitors in Oregon are so truly, uh, truly concerned on behalf of, of our customers. As I've watched uh, through the process, and, uh, and seeing how, how my friends at Northwest Natural Grass have worked so hard to convince the PUC that our customers de deserve an even bigger rate decrease. Uh, I know, Paula, I'll pay for that with the first question. <laughs> and Dick Wrighton will get me later as well. Uh, anyway, what, what I want to say is that clearly there are some things that we would do different uh, the next time around, but I think we've gotten the important pieces uh, of this merger right. And Leadership is both an opportunity to learn and, and, to, and to benefit from those lessons. And make no mistake about it, we are breaking new ground with this proposed merger. Our industry is changing with or without us, and frankly, with or without this merger that we're discussing with you today. And it will affect all of us. Early this week, AT&T announced that they were re-entering the retail phone service business by offering to attach to your homes a wireless box that will allow you to cut the hard wire to that home and forever, if you wish, do without your current local telephone service and have promised better quality service. Now, this isn't an ad for AT&T. The point is that when you unleash today's technology in a competitive market, you get products and services that people never previously dreamed of, and that's what's going to happen in our industry. The restructuring process that we're talking about and that we're a part of is not so much a push from electric utilities to escape regulation as much as it is a demand from growing numbers of customers to escape monopoly because they have seen the innovation that results from competitive marketplaces. Against this backdrop of industry transformation, it is important to understand some of the key decisions and important beliefs that we've held that have been influential in leading to the fact that we are today standing before you talking about a merger that Forbes magazine found so unique that they named it the deal of the year for 1996. We're talking about a merger with a company that just uh, recently was, was uh, elected for the second year in a row, the most innovative company in America, that's Fortune magazine, and in the same poll, recognized as the most admired company in their industry for the third or fourth or fifth year in a row. In an important, in an environment of rapid change and transformation and restructuring that we're talking about, we concluded a number of years ago that the status quo was not an option, that if we let competitors set our transformation agenda for us, that we would be certain losers. The choices were to be either a leader or a follower, or in the words, uh, very memorable words to me, of a noted business author, Gary Hamill, in the race to the future, there are drivers, there are passengers, and there is roadkill. 
A roadkill, as you know, is a uniquely Western turn of phrase that describes those poor, unfortunate creatures who happen to pass across the highway in front of an oncoming vehicle. Passengers, of course, will get to the future, but their fate will be in someone else's hands. It's those who drive industry revolution, companies that have a clear and premeditated, premeditated view of where they wish to take their industry and their business, and are capable of focusing both their financial and their intellectual resources on getting there first, who will be the companies that are rewarded. In a transforming industry, incrementalization is not enough. You can't just cut a few more costs on the edge and compete. That's not enough. You can't just merge with another company that looks just like you and lay off 1,000 employees to compete. That's not enough. That's frankly what's happened is happening for the most part in our industry. You have to compete in a transforming industry by being different, by redefining the rules and challenging industry orthodox. At PGC and PGE, we began that redefinition a number of years ago when we initiated a number of contrarian actions that at the time were considered by many to be both risky and questionable. In 1990, for instance, we cut our common stock dividend to nearly half the rate that the rest of the industry was, was prevalent in the rest of the industry at that time. Since that moment in time, our shareholders have given up $260 million worth of dividends based on that cut. A tough decision, a painful one, but one necessary to prepare for a competitive environment. In the early 1990s, a, a topic that you uh, heard about, in fact, at this club and I testified on, we made the unprecedented decision after determining that nuclear power was going to have a difficult time being economic in a deregulating market to become the first company to voluntarily close down a perfectly good operating nuclear plant that has paid dividends since that time. At the same time, or shortly thereafter, as we evaluate our, our options in the aftermath of that decision, we once again challenged conventional wisdom and did something unthinkable in our world and said, we believe there's a surplus of energy out there. We ought to buy it instead. Now, you have to keep in mind the only way companies like ours make more money is to invest. That's the historical incentive. We said, no, there's, there's a better way to do it. We'll buy it, and, and we'll beat the price that anyone can pay or that can uh, give that has uh, resources or bills resources. That, has, too, has paid enormous dividends to our customers since that decision. In the same environment, we were the first electric utility to invest in a trading floor that would allow us to more efficiently both access and market uh, these abundant supplies of gas and electricity. Collectively, these and other similar decisions have already delivered enormous benefits to our customers. They are largely the factors that allowed us to offer a $70 million rate reduction in December of last year, the largest rate reduction in Oregon history, and are why our prices over the last 10 years to our customers have declined by 17 percent on a real basis, while nationally rates have increased by 8 percent in the same time period. Now keep in mind this is in a part of the world that already enjoys probably the lowest electric prices in the world. Interestingly enough, those same de decisions that are benefiting our consumers are what made PGC an attractive merger partner for Enron. They, too, have a history of redefining the rules of their industry. That brings me to where we are today and the merger. So let me just quickly describe the current status of our merger pro progress and process. We announced the merger on July 22nd of last year, and since that time have been going through the various approval and preparatory steps necessary to implement the combination. Today, most of those approvals, including that that was referred to er earlier by Christine, uh, by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, are in hand, and I might add, in record time. Two important approvals remain to be received, the Oregon Public Utility Commission and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We hope and expect that the NRC approval should be in hand relatively soon, we see no major issues there. With the Public Utility Commission, we have made some very important progress, but still have one issue to resolve. Of the 24 issues 
that we initially started with, we've agreed in principle on 23 of those issues. This includes agreeing to, happily, higher service quality standards than any other utility in this state is being held accountable to, standards that we're proud of and absolutely confident we can maintain after this merger. Our first proposal to the Public Utility Commission staff called for customers to get all merger-related cost reduction savings. That's atypical in our business as well, because typically there's a request to share in those savings. The PUC preferred to have a guaranteed minimum uh, savings, which we have subsequently offered and agreed to. Enron has also agreed to a full, and what I would say indeed are generous compensation for any non-utility use of PG assets or personnel. The only remaining issue relates to additional rate reductions surrounding the question of whether or not customers should get paid for intangible assets that are not on our balance sheet, such as intellectual capital and PGE name value. Now, I had, couldn't help but reflect as I look at the uh, coverage we've had over the last uh, couple of months that clearly the name value has gone down. <laughs> and no one's accusing me of having a lot of intellectual capital recently. So I think we're getting close to cl uh, closing this gap here real soon. <clears throat> we will be working hard, very seriously, uh, over the next uh, several days and before next Thursday trying to close uh, that uh, that difference and to come up with solutions that guarantee our customers additional benefits. What you will not see from us now or in the future is an agreement that cuts costs in ways that compromise service quality or rate cuts that are built upon the shoulders of our employees. We believe that some of those recent proposals raise unacceptable risks in that regard and we will not agree to them purely and simply. So let me close just by sharing with you some personal convictions about the obligations and responsibilities of business leadership, which I think are relevant to our merger proposal. There is, of course, an obligation to shareholders. Uh, many of our shareholders are Oregonians. All of our employees are. To create value, which this merger does. But keep in mind that those shareholders have paid dearly with the preparatory actions that I referred to earlier, such as dividend cuts and hundreds of millions of dollars of nuclear write-offs that were necessary preconditions for this merger to ever come into reality. All business, of course, is accountable to its customers. In our circumstance, that involves an obligation to provide safe, reliable, cost-effective service. I've already talked about the service standards that we've agreed to. We will add additional cost reductions uh, as a part of the merger approval process to already competitive and amongst the lowest prices in, in the world. So this merger speaks to our customers. Our customers will be benefited by it. Business leadership also has a responsibility to employees as well, and amongst other things. Management owes their employees an opportunity for growth, if that is at all possible. When I look around the world at Enron's operations, the fact that we will start new businesses here, that we will grow businesses here, we believe this merger speaks admirably to that obligation, unlike the vast majority of mergers in this country today. Lastly, of course, business leadership has an accountability to the community that they live and work in. When I suggested to Ken Lay that we could reduce anxiety in the community by showing an upfront commitment to long-term community participation and support, he quickly and happily agreed to helping us establish a $25 million foundation that will be permanently guided by Oregonians for the benefit of Oregonians. Some of merger opponents quickly labeled this buy-off, but I wonder what they would have said had we not addressed the issue at all. When we had an opportunity to sit down with Oregon environmental and public service groups and make some concrete commitments around issues of concern to, to them which benefit 
Oregon fisheries and programs for low-income people. Some portrayed that as a buy-off. But I believe we need to provide assurances to these important Oregon values and that they be preserved as our industry changes. Business also has an accountability which I think each of us shares individually. And that is that we have to acknowledge that it's our responsibility to create the future, not just wait for it to happen to us. And that's what this merger is about. It's about creating the future, a better future for each of these constituencies than would have existed without it, not just waiting for that to happen to us. Collectively, I believe that we've addressed each of those constituencies in a manner that creates a bright future and allows this merger, and indeed Oregon, to be a model for how these matters are managed in the future. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken Lay and thank you again. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon. I'm also pleased to uh, have this opportunity today to, to uh, speak to this uh, forum. I'm told uh, I've heard good things about the forum, and certainly uh, uh, thus far I have no reason to, to doubt that. A great audience out there today. Ken did mention our experience of two weeks ago, two weeks ago today, uh, uh, before the Oregon Public Utility Commission. And I did allow, to, as how to him before we left the offices today, that if uh, if today uh, didn't turn out all that well, I might try to schedule my next trip for a Thursday or some other day. And, and he seemed to think that was appropriate. Uh, and I, I appreciate, Ken, you mentioning the uh, uh, Fortune Magazine most admired list, and, and we are proud of that. We did rank uh, above all of the other energy companies in the country. Uh, but I, I, in reading that earlier, I thought maybe some of the ballots from Oregon got lost. So if there's a, any of you think your vote wasn't counted, well, we'll try to at least give you a shot at it. Maybe uh, it may not be too late. Uh, Ken has covered uh, most aspects of the uh, merger, uh, the, these are the key points, and certainly we're going to both be uh, uh, talking, I think, quite a bit about that during the Q&A. Uh, so I'd just like to share a couple of comments on the merger, <clears throat> and this has been most of my time talking a little bit more about uh, about Enron and about this changing energy environment, uh, both domestically and worldwide, that, uh, that Ken referred to. Uh, it was about four years ago that, that Enron did decide that it uh, was going to become, or try to become, a major participant uh, in all aspects of the electricity business, uh, including uh, marketing electricity down to the retail consumer level. Now, as we thought through our strategy on that, it was also about that time uh, that we decided just as we have very substantial physical assets in the natural gas business, which are, of course uh, are very helpful from the standpoint of being a major nationwide marketer of natural gas, it would also be necessary to have a number of physical assets, physical platforms, if you would, uh, in the electricity business to make sure that at least we were at no competitive disadvantage uh, with any other uh, marketers of electricity. And we did decide that uh, certainly uh, uh, one way to try to, 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 to bring those uh, uh, assets and people and intellectual capital, Ken, uh, into the company uh, in, a, in a fairly uh, significant way was to try to identify uh, uh, one or more electric utilities that might be good partners with us in this very rapidly changing and deregulating uh, uh, electricity marketplace. We began our screening process, our evaluation, uh, literally looking at uh, dozens of different utilities, which very quickly uh, uh, narrowed down, uh, as far as our criteria, uh, to fewer than uh, 10, uh, probably even fewer than uh, uh, five or six, uh, that we really thought met the criteria that we thought would, uh, would be a good strategic fit with Enron, and in fact would uh, significantly enhance our strategy as we move forward in this, in this marketplace. And then, of course, from that list, it came down to two or three. And then, of course, finally, uh, uh, after even after there had been some, uh, uh, nego not negotiating, but discussions, and, of course, some deals done with Portland General, uh, we did identify Portland General as the one that uh, uh, seemed to have the best fit. And, of course, uh, uh, a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into all of that right here. But certainly what we found was that the senior executives at Portland General 
and their board uh, had a philosophy pretty much uh, akin to our philosophy and an outlook pretty much akin to our outlook as to where this industry was headed and what it was going to take to be a winner in this changing industry versus uh, uh, either being a passenger or roadkill, Ken, uh, in your words. Uh, and, and let me say, though that strategic fit did not necessarily include the fact that their CEO's name started with Ken. Uh, that didn't hurt anything, but, uh, uh, but that was not the main consideration. But it did look as though Portland General, more so than virtually any other utility that we had evaluated or thought about or talked to, uh, did have a philosophy and an outlook and a culture and a strategy uh, that very much fit uh, the, the, the one at Enron. And, and we did move ahead uh, from there uh, off and on for almost two years uh, negotiating this transaction, which is a very long time for any uh, transaction like this to uh, uh, mature. Uh, but it's, it was very necessary, I think, and in part very necessary to really uh, determine on both sides exactly how it would fit together and how it would work. <clears throat> and then, of course, we did finally uh, uh, reach agreement uh, as to how we wanted to put it together, uh, both, both uh, company managements, uh, both boards, and we announced it last July. Uh, so this is a transaction and this is a proposed merger uh, that has had tremendous thought and preparation put into it over a fairly extended period of time. Uh, when in fact, uh, Ken, I, I'd ha have to uh, think pretty hard as to what things we didn't think about during that period of time. And I will say finally, before I move on with some other comments, uh, which may surprise some of you, uh, there's not been a single time uh, since uh, we announced it uh, that I or my management team or my board uh, thought in fact we'd made a mistake. Uh, we're very much committed to this merger. Uh, we're very much committed to putting these two companies together. Uh, we think as strongly today as we did last July that this is uh, part of a winning strategy in a rapidly changing uh, marketplace. Now with those comments, except for what will surely be uh, uh, quite a few questions during the Q&A period, uh, I'd like to move on in instead to talk a little bit about Enron, uh, which many of you know a lot less about, I think, than you do Portland General, and maybe much of which you know about it. Uh, uh, you've, you've gotten through second and third hand sources, <clears throat> so I'd like to provide you maybe a little different view about Enron. And probably equally important for this merger, and what we're talking about today is, is the way we view the marketplace, the energy marketplace, uh, and where we think it's headed, and why we think uh, uh, this merger, as well as many other things that we and Portland General are doing, uh, are highly necessary, probably, probably critical, uh, if we're going to be winners in this environment. Uh, to begin with, Enron is one of the largest uh, integrated uh, uh, natural gas and electricity companies in the world. Uh, we are the top natural gas and electricity wholesale marketer uh, in North America. And we believe by most standards, we've been the most successful developer of uh, energy infrastructure in the world over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. And by most accounts, uh, we are one of the best operators of natural gas pipelines, of oil and gas uh, properties, gas liquids facilities, power plants, and other energy assets in the world. Uh, we're also becoming one of the largest uh, international suppliers of wind and solar renewable energy. <clears throat> I say these things not to necessarily brag about Enron, but more to say that uh, we are proud to be a leader uh, in a great industry. But we believe our achievements so far are just uh, the beginning. And we believe, in fact, there's even a lot more exciting future ahead of us uh, in, this, uh, in this business. In North America, the movement to deregulation, uh, or deregulating the electric utilities has begun, as Ken said. Uh, deregulation is coming inevitably and day by day. And in fact, is, if anything, accelerating and moving much quicker than most people would have thought even as recently as a year ago. Uh, the result will be the opening up of a huge $200 billion a year market, uh, one of the largest markets in our economy. In the other Western industrial uh, nations, a related reality is underway. Uh, State-owned monopolies are giving way to private companies. And in the developing world, new markets are emerging as governments turn toward privatization, uh, especially in areas of telecommunications, 
transportation, and of course, energy. A pol political scientist would sum up these changes as the retreat of socialism and command and control economies and the advance of free markets. And that's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't quite capture the profound practical impact of these developments. Deregulation at home and privatization abroad mean that monopolies are being broken up, uh, new markets are being opened up and liberated, and consumers are being able to reap benefits so big that they will actually improve in a fairly profound way the quality of life of individuals here and around the globe. We believe that deregulation is, is the third major event in the history of electricity. Uh, the first took place the day a genius named Edison lifted his hand, pulled on a cord, and the electric light went on uh, about a century ago. The second one that followed, the lighting of towns and cities across the country by companies such as Portland General, uh, that evolved, and for some very good reasons, into the big state and federally regulated electric utilities of today. The third major event is happening now. The deregulation of those utilities and the opening up of the entire U.S. electricity market. For the first time, local consumers from factories uh, to mom and pop stores to suburban uh, homeowners and city apartment dwellers will have something they never expected to have. Choice of, choice of from whom they will purchase their electricity. Uh, this will bring new suppliers of electricity and a lot of competition. Uh, this will lead to new services and new possibilities for conservation. We believe cleaner energy as consumers make those choices as to what kind of energy they want to buy and use. Uh, new products that will save the consumer money. And of course, uh, uh, virtually everywhere, uh, lower electric bills. In fact, we believe that when deregulation fully comes, Enron and other companies will be able to reduce consumer electricity bills across the country by 30 to 40 percent. And that's pretty well documented by an awful lot of independent sources today. A cut that big would be comparable to a national tax cut of 60 to 80 billion dollars per year. That would make a real difference to families. It would make a serious difference to businesses and their competitive position in the global economy. And it would be a great boon to the U.S. economy. The force of the energy future we are entering isn't only the opening up of markets. It is also the fantastic growth of at least some of these energy markets. Most energy experts are predicting the global demand for energy over the next 20 years uh, will increase by about 50%. Uh, they further forecast that the demand for clean energy or cleaner energy and particularly natural gas, renewable energy and electricity will go up at least one and a half times the rate of growth of total energy consumption and about double the rate of growth for coal and oil. So the landscape is not only changing and shifting, it's expanding. And Enron's moving to stake out its claim on that landscape. We believe we've positioned ourselves as well as we can as compared to others in order to be one of the major winners around the world as these markets open up and as the demand for clean energy keeps growing. In the United States, we're moving forward in a state-by-state -state basis uh, to work toward uh, deregulating the retail marketplace. Uh, and, and of course, that, as I said, is, if anything, accelerating even faster than we would have thought a few months ago. We are forging local business relationships, uh, such as the one with Portland General that we're talking about here today, which is one of the most significant ones we've, we've forged, that will help us move fast and first when deregulation comes. And knowing that in the future, many of our customers will not be industry professionals, or at least professionals in large companies, uh, but instead will be small homeowners and small shops, uh, we have launched a national campaign to tell the public who we are and what we have to offer. As part of our overall effort, we have started a new standalone business uh, that will concentrate on the retail, natural gas, and electricity business and nothing else. A business already with a sizable workforce that is growing rapidly and we believe will have a few tens of thousands of employees shortly after the turn of the next century. In the other industrial nations, we continue uh, 
uh, to seize the opportunities. A few years ago, we completed the first independent power plant in the United Kingdom. And today, it produces about 4% of all of the electricity in that country. Uh, we are the first non-Nordic company to go into Oslo and market electricity in the newly deregulated Nordic market, uh, which represents, surprisingly enough, about 12% of all the electricity generated on, in continental Europe. In both cases, we were in early because we pushed for change uh, before it was a reality. And when it came, we were there. We have just begun the construction of a large clean power plant in Italy. And we're the contractor and 50% owner of a new natural gas combined cycle plant that just recently got under construction in Turkey, uh, the first natural gas combined cycle plant ever in that country. In the developing world, we continue to move as markets open, and we continue to open them where we can. In the Philippines, where growing and severe energy shortfalls had workers scheduling shifts around blackouts and the economy stalled, uh, we helped solve the problem by going in and building two fast-track power plants on either end of that island. The country now has reliable electricity and is enjoying rapid economic growth. In India, we've gone forward with the first major private foreign investment energy project in that country's history. The $1 billion phase one power project in Debo, uh, just south of Bombay, will provide electricity for the entire state of Maharashtra, the most industrialized uh, state in India, with phase two providing even more electricity and LNG. Uh, the first LNG receiving f facility for that entire country of 900 million people. This will be one of the largest natural gas power plants in the world. We will quite literally be bringing electricity to people, uh, to children and schools and hospitals that have never had it before, at least never had it from a central source. Uh, this particular project, as many of you know, did have uh, some difficult times. After it was under construction, it was canceled by the the, the new government in Maharashtra. Uh, we stayed, we took the flak, uh, we restarted talks. Now, we're not talking about Oregon here. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about India. And at the end, we negotiated a new agreement that resulted in a bigger and a better project than the one that was canceled. A little side comment on that, the more publicity that project got in the country, uh, the more support for privatization grew. As many people begin to conclude that privatization and foreign investment uh, might be the way to eliminate many of the electricity shortages in that country. In Argentina, we are an owner and the operator of the largest natural gas pipeline in South America, uh, which we've expanded significantly since it was privatized and sold to us in 1992. Uh, during 1996, we completed and put into operation the first Western-developed independent power project in China. We also have operating pipelines in Colombia and Bolivia and are developing a very large pipeline and power plant project to serve the enormous Brazilian market as it's opening up. Again, I point out all of this activity uh, not to impress you, but instead to try to convince you that we have a lot of very outstanding professional people around the world putting together good quality, clean energy projects that in fact are changing the lives of those people and the destiny of those countries. Uh, I think more than ever, we're convinced that this business, as it changes, needs the long view, which is kind of interesting as the, as the short-term rate of change is accelerating, we're even more convinced that you've got a plan for the long term. We're investing time and resources now, planting seed, seeds now that will bear fruit, bolstering market development efforts, cultiva cultivating change, growing the company, uh, with our proposed merger with Portland General being uh, one such long-term view. In doing these things, we not only enhance our future position and create markets for which Enron will be a major supplier, we are also creating uh, uh, growth opportunities for our employees, all of our employees, obviously shareholder value for our stockholders, as well as improving the communities where we live and work. Uh, we know from our own history that our greatest opportunities for growth have always come during periods of significant industry change. Uh, we're very much involved in the change in the natural gas business from regulated to unregulated in the mid-1980s, and we subsequently became the largest marketer of natural gas in, in North America. In the early 90s, we were also involved in the, in the move to deregulate the wholesale electricity markets. 
As I said today, uh, we believe we're the largest wholesale marketer of electricity in the U.S. And of course now we're taking the lead, or one of the leads, in moving toward deregulating the retail electricity markets. And again, once again, we've set a high goal uh, to become the largest marketer of retail electricity in this country uh, once it, the markets are fully deregulated. And again, all of this uh, has not been true for, uh, forever. This country company was created, as Christine said, in 1985 when two very sizable 50-year-old energy companies merged. Uh, with that merger of Houston Natural Gas and Internorth, uh, we'd created a company with about a $2 billion market value, and our debt to total capitalization ratio at that time was 73% which meant basically we were a junk bond rated company. We moved to build off our existing assets to grow our businesses. Uh, the result is that year in 1996, we were a $12 billion market value company and our debt total capitalization was 40% and we're knocking at the door of an A minus rating. Uh, we have continued to grow and change the company on a very consistent basis. In 1996, 40% of our net income was derived from new businesses that didn't exist 10 years ago. And these are businesses we created, such as specialized energy financing, wholesale electricity marketing, natural gas risk management, and international infrastructure development. We've done this with a pretty simple philosophy. Uh, deregulation means greater freedom. Freedom means consumer choice. Choice means competition. Competition demands creativity new products and solutions, new serv services uh, and savings. The solutions and savings we can offer benefit consumers. Now that translates into benefits to our companies, our employees, our shareholders, and of course to our communities where we do business. That's our ph ph philosophy. Our operating style, our corporate culture is marked by hunger for markets, a passion for competition, uh, some talent for anticipated trends, a gift for thinking outside the traditional box and a willingness to take disciplined risk. And it very much includes a willingness to create opportunities and invest in the most promising of them with the hope that most of them are successful. They're not all successful. Our past and future means of keeping our culture is also simple. Are the best people from wherever they come, whether it be from other companies or from universities or from high schools, but are the best people give them authority and responsibility, lift unnecessary bureaucratic demands, build in financial incentives for them, establish structures that promote creativity and independence. Our people have often been called the thought leaders in the industry because they've been able to predict long-term how the industry will move and what that movement means. So that is a little summary of Enron, who we are, how we see the new world of energy, and why we think we're poised for extraordinary growth, and also why we think the proposed merger uh, with uh, Portland General will be good for both Enron and Portland General, as well as all of our respective constituents. We intend, intend to continue uh, to get in early, push to open markets, uh, position ourselves to compete, compete hard when the opening comes. We're convinced that as more the world opens up to competition, which it is, uh, the companies that have the best record will win, and we're certainly uh, convinced that our combined companies, Portland General and Enron, will have that record. So indeed, uh, we believe we are reinventing the energy business, and with Portland General uh, being a, an important part of this reinvention, uh, we are optimistic about the future for Enron and Portland General, and we believe our proposed merger will be great for all of our combined employees, all of our combined shareholders, uh, as well as all of the communities where, which we call home. Thank you. The merger of your two companies would yield about $675 million for shareholders. But according to your last proposal, only about 41 to $50 million in rate cuts for PGE customers over four years. The PUC staff has said customers should be getting about four times that much in rate cuts. 
Why is there such an enormous gap between what you're offering for shareholders versus customers, and why such a large difference between what the PUC staff is recommending and your proposal? It seems like I've heard that question before. I, uh, uh, well, let, 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 me, let me say several things. Of course, one is uh, uh, we, in fact, of course, paid for Portland General what uh, uh, we determined, and obviously what Ken Harrison determined, we had to pay for it in order to buy it. And, and, and that is something that uh, managements and boards decide on behalf of shareholders. Uh, and it is a nice premium for the, for the shareholders. Now, as Ken said, uh, many of these same shareholders had some pretty rocky times over the years as, as Ken and his team made the right decisions as far as uh, shutting down and writing off a good chunk of a nuclear plant and, and reducing dividends and so forth. Uh, but that's what shareholders uh, are, are paid to do. They take risks. Sometimes the stock goes down, sometimes it goes up, but in, indeed they are the owners of the company. So I guess I'll be begin with the fact that, in fact, we paid what we think is a very fair price for Portland General. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, I think the shareholders uh, have at least uh, said it's a share fair price because they've now voted to accept uh, the offer. Uh, as to the, as to the uh, uh, rate payers, uh, let me first say, I think, in fact, if you, if you tally up everything we had in that last proposal, I think the hard cash part of the savings uh, for the consumer is about $50 million. Oops. Don't, don't, I don't want to lose him. He's, he's the one that knows all these facts. Uh, but, but the hard cash savings to the consumers uh, from the, on the front end of this, of this uh, transaction, about $50 million. I think there are other... Uh, savings that we would estimate at about 50 million. So in fact, the total savings are closer to 100 million in total, uh, which we think, uh, and again, no, those are all the savings we can identify as to the immediate uh, uh, cost reductions and synergies that we can, we can achieve through this, this merger. Uh, if, they're, if they're greater than that over time, obviously that we've already agreed, as Ken, Ken said, to flow all of those through to the consumers. Uh, let me say, I think the biggest single savings the consumers are going to have is, is of course, as part of the, uh, the, the, the proposal also, we've said that within 60 days after the merger closes, uh, we will sub submit a comprehensive plan uh, for opening up all of the markets uh, served by Portland General, all, all categories of customers. Uh, and, and, and based on our experience elsewhere and other experiences elsewhere, uh, the biggest savings to consumers is going to result from that, uh, moving quicker to uh, open markets, choice, and competition uh, with the consumers uh, being able to choose their suppliers, whether it be Enron or somebody else, but getting competition going for their business, uh, which we think will significantly reduce electric uh, rates. Ken, you want to add something? Very quickly, three quick things. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to just uh, say thank you once again. There's Northwest Natural Gas looking after our customers. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, but two things in addition. One, as I noted, the same decisions that I went through that produced a $70 million rate cut in December, the decisions that are producing enormous benefits to customers already, not related to the merger per se, but they're the decisions that also made us a valuable asset to Enron. So whether you consider it related or not, they're the same factors that benefit customers and that made us valuable in this merger. Secondly, around the country, there is no precedent for looking at merger premiums and passing any share or even relating that premium uh, to, to what customer benefits are. None. It's been specifically considered in other mergers, including the one that some gentleman right here in this room went through over in Utah, and they said there is no relationship. And now we'll turn it over to our panel, uh, Mike Katz and Charlie Davis. Thank you. My name is Mike Katz. Um, in competition, and you're making a big pitch for it, and I'm persuaded it's a good thing, there are winners and sometimes losers. And Oregon ratepayers in general, but Pacific, but uh, Portland General Electric Company ratepayers in particular, don't want to be losers. Um, Ken Lay, you're an economist, and I'm sure you know about Pareto optimality, which says that there is a point beyond which the only way you can make somebody better off is by making somebody else worse off. And when we see that rates, electricity rates in California, average 
if I'm not mistaken, according to Electric Edison Institute, 10.44 cents per kilowatt hour against Portland General Electric Company's average rates, residential, commercial, and industrial, of only 5.11 cents per kilowatt hour. We're wondering whether or not after there's deregulation and the Public Utility Commission is no longer here to look down your throats, why we would be advantaged rather than perhaps disadvantaged. Can you give us some guarantees or assurances or <laughs> elevate our level of confidence? <laughs> May I go to the general first? I want you to talk specifically about, about the experience in, in, at Portland General. I mean, I, uh, and, and there has been a lot of, uh, a, a lot written about uh, maybe taking cheap power, particularly Bonneville power, out of Oregon, out of Portland General, and taking it to California. Well, first of all, uh, by law, we can't do that. I mean, the, the law that established uh, Portland General, in fact, also established where that power goes and on what terms it goes there. Uh, so the, the, so it, there, there's no way Enron or Portland General can take that, uh, quote, cheaper Portland, uh, Bonneville power gas and take it to California. I don't want to interrupt uh, uh, unnecessarily, but there's also Round Butte, Pelton Dam, and the Mid-Columbia yeah. dams, which are not federal projects. I understand. And my, my second point was that, uh, as I understand it, the, uh, the Bonneville power electricity, which is some of the cheapest electricity in, in the region, is about two and a half cents. Is that about where you are today? Two and a half cents a, a kilowatt hour. Uh, and, and I know for a fact we at Enron have entered into long-term, five-year, being long-term, five-year contracts uh, selling wholesale power from other sources outside of the Northwest at at least 20 or 25 percent below that. And that's exactly what the competitive market's doing today. I mean, uh, as you say, winners and losers, there, there will be some winners and losers. Uh, I don't think the, the losers are going to be the consumers. The, the, the losers are going to be some of the higher priced or higher cost uh, generators and utilities and others that, that are going to find it difficult to compete. Uh, but the main thing, this whole deregulation has already kicked off at the wholesale level and it will be even, even stronger, more intense with retail competition, is, is creating a nationwide market where, in fact, electricity is going to be sourced from the cheapest supply sources and, of course, be transmitted and distributed in, in, the, in the most efficient ways. Uh, and just through the process, significant downward pressure on costs. But what I'm saying today, we, 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 we can aggregate supplies today uh, even below the current, uh, uh, as you say, relatively low prices for electricity in the Northwest. And I think you've got some, maybe some experience in industrial markets here that would confirm about the same thing. Absolutely. Two, two quick things, Mike, because I know we want to move through the questions. Uh, first of all, uh, simply the losers are going to be the owners of the high-cost assets. Uh, they're the ones that are going to lose in the long run. And to the extent that we have high-cost assets, then our, our shareholders will lose. As you know, we have some of the lowest prices in the country. Secondly, there, there's certainly full latitude, and we anticipate that in, that in the deregulation process or the restructuring process, that all of our low-cost resources will be continue, uh, will be by, by virtue of the regulatory rules that are in place at that time will be uh, dedicated to our customers. There will be re no reallocation of those. The other thing is just to reinforce what Ken already said. Our experience here in the, in the part of the world that has the lowest prices in the world and the provider that has uh, probably control of the lowest cost hydro system in the world, Bonneville, we opened up that market to c competition and we drove their prices down. That's what happens. The losers are the folks that own high cost resources. The winners are the folks out there that get the benefit of innovation and get the benefit of competition. You want to follow up? I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Harrison a question. Uh, utility regulation requires uh, views advocated uh, to be presented in a forum where opposite views can be advocated. Doesn't uh, preclude the First Amendment, of course, but when uh, legislators join in the process and uh, in the outside the public hearing and advocate a particular outcome, it uh, diminishes the ability of the regulators to make a decision based on the facts they've heard. Uh, why did PGE introduce legislation to alter the authority of the Public Utility Commission after the matter was before the Commission? Short, short answer? Bad judgment. Long answer, 
This is legislation that we had in, uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, uh, works for a long time. It, it was not a surprise. We uh, fully apprised the commission staff and asked them to apprise the, uh, uh, the uh, okay. commissioners of that. We, uh, we also... I, I, I don't need the long answer. Yeah. Let's, let's go to the next question. I'll give you the long answer first next, then, if you're going to give well, me that. Well, <laughs> uh, as, as an ex-commissioner, I'm not bound by protocol. Let me ask you the other question is, if, if this deal is not approved, will, will PGE seek legislation to bypass the commission or limit its authority? Let me say first that we, we've asked that the legislation be pulled off, that it not be acted on while this is being under, underway. As I already said, we were pursuing the legislation prior, uh, prior to this. Uh, is per that personally, personally, I believe that what the, what the legislation deals with is separation of regulated business and deregulated businesses. Yeah. That is perfectly aligned with the, all of the positions that the commission that's currently there has taken place in the past. We've gone to religious uh, detail to make sure that regulated and deregulated businesses were separated. Our legislation only supports that. And, and yes, if, whether this goes through or not, I believe in that separation and we would pursue it. I will not pursue it as a way to override this commission. I think they can kill it, they can make this deal go away, and we're not going to fight it with legislation. I will fight that philosophically. And, and, and let me just add real quickly, and I said this to the commission, I think two weeks ago today, uh, and again, Ken and I both agreed it would it, have been better if that legislation had not been introduced, although there was a deadline being faced there. Uh, but, but as Ken said, first of all, philosophically, it's not inconsistent with the position that the Commission itself has taken con consistently on, on this issue. Uh, but secondly, there's no way that legislation could have ever meaningfully circumvented the Commission anyway. I mean, this, th this transaction will be approved or killed by the Oregon Public Utility Commission. And by the time that the legislature gets around to acting, uh, it will either be approved or it will be dead. The legislation, yes, I, I under, legislation is also co totally aligned with the governor's proposed uh, policy on, on uh, the process that we should go through for deregulation of our industry. Well, governor Kitts offers. Let me respond uh, quickly. I understand mm -hmm. the, that, that part of the process. I under, also understand the coercive power of introducing legislation to bypass the commission. I, I'd like to go to Mike's next question, if I could. Excuse me, we just had a motion from the floor. This would be our normal adjournment time to extend the meeting for another 15 minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, this would have to be done by majority vote. All in favor, please uh, signify by raising your hands. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <laughs>